morning, everyone. Um, my name is Chris Johnson. I am one of the individuals who coordinates and sits with Pints with the Pack. Pints with the Pack is a group that um, traditionally met monthly to discuss men's health, um, masculinity, and all the things in between. And I just would like to start off this morning with honoring the nations. So we just would like to acknowledge the land and the ancestors of the first people who walked this land before us. Respect to the descendants who walk this land with us and the future generations who will walk this land when we are gone. Sar or Sonare, sorry, and Pints with the Pack is situated on Treaty 7 and Treaty 4 territory, traditional lands of the Siksika, the Kainai, Pikani, Stony Nation, Tutina, the Cree, Sioux, Assiniboi, and Salt Toe Bands of the Ojibwe people. These are also the lands of the Métis people. And all of us, regardless of background, are all treaty people. This was um, the, the treaties that were signed between two nations. And just an honoring of all things in between. I'm just admitting more people now as we continue. So we just would like to welcome you to this online virtual space. And I would like to take a minute to, to um, welcome you, of course, to this um, presentation today or this conversation. I guess it's a conversation. Hey, Jackson. Um, and I'd like to welcome to this space Jackson Katz, PhD. He is an internationally re internationally renowned for his pioneering scholarship and activism on issues of gender, race, and violence. He has long been a major figure and thought leader in the growing global movement of men working to promote gender equality and prevent gender violence. He is the co-founder of the multiracial mixed gender mentors in violence prevention or MVP program, one of the longest running and most widely influential gender violence prevention programs in North America and beyond. He is the author of several or like numerous articles and two books, the best classic or the story, the classic bestseller, The Marshall Paradox, Why Some Men Hurt Women and How All Men Can Help and the critically acclaimed Man Enough, Donald Trump, Hillary Clinton, and the politics of presidential masculinity. He is the creator of the award-winning Tough Guys educational documentary series, as well as the video, The Bystander Movement, Transforming Rape, Rape Culture at Its Roots. His most recent film released in October 2020 is, the entit is entitled The Man Card, White Male Identity Politics from Nixon to Trump. Katz has new, appeared in numerous popular documentaries, including Hip Hop, Beyond Beats and Rhymes, Misrepresentation, and The Mask You Live In. His TED Talk, Violence Against Women is a Men's Issue, has over 4.5 million views. I've watched that one maybe a couple times myself. Um, and he has le lectured and trained in all 50 states, eight Canadian provinces, and every continent except Antarctica. Holy moly, <laughs> that's a lot of traveling, hey? Um, and then you can go to his website, which is mvpstrategies.com for more information. So welcome, Jackson. We're very honored to have you with us today. Thank you very much, Chris. It's great to be with you. I think your initiative is, you know, is really, really great. And I'm, I'm pleased and honored to be part of it. Thank you. Thank you. We are we're excited to be holding this space um, in this way and be in, and to be inviting everyone in um, to be able to hold these issues over the last, well, gosh, it's been like two and a half months of basically every other Sunday or every Sunday bringing together just different speakers to really start to expand knowledge and dig deeper and move into vulnerability. Um, so we're really excited for that. This morning we've had a bit of a tech issue, so you'll notice that there's a bit of a difference that's happened, everybody, just to let you know that some of the housekeeping is that we were not able to use um, Zoom webinar this morning, so we're using Zoom Meets. So if you can just please keep your videos off and your mics muted, and then just pop your questions into the chat box and we'll be able to move forward from there. 
and um, we'll be able to get the questions asked as they come along or towards the end of the meeting. So just the gentle housekeeping. So, so Jackson, we have some questions for you, or I have some questions for you um, on this beautiful Sunday morning, or not so beautiful, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> not so beautiful this morning. Um, Jackson, you, sh you believe that violence against women is a men's health issue. And I was hoping you could help me understand that a little bit deeper. Sure. Well, it's a, it's a men's issue in many different dimensions. And I'll, I'll, I guess I start with the general and then get to the specific um, about the men's health piece of it. But um, part of the reason why I say it's a men's issue is because, um, let's just be honest, men are committing the vast majority of the vast majority of violence against women in the world is committed by men. That's not a debatable point. It's, uh, you know, when it comes to sexual assault, men commit the overwhelming majority of sexual assault in the world, um, whether the victims are, you know, uh, women, which they are in approximately 90% of uh, cases or men and 10% and people who aren't men or women men are the perpetrators in the overwhelming number of cases. So call, for example, calling rape a women's issue um, shifts accountability off of men as a group, if you will, and puts it on to women. And so a lot of people think, well, yeah, rape and sexual assault and domestic violence, these are women's issues that some good men help out with. And I have a problem with that premise. And I think the very premise keeps us from really addressing the problem and, and getting to you know realistic uh, solutions. And let me just add, I don't think it's anti-male in any way, not even for a millisecond to say what I've been saying. I don't think it's anti-male to say that violence against women is a men's issue. I don't think it's anti-male to say that men need to start taking responsibility and standing up and standing with women as their partners and allies in these matters. None of this in any way is anti-male. And I say that because I think some men are so defensive about this subject matter um, that that the, even the slightest hint of accountability when it attaches to men's uh, power and privilege vis-a-vis -vis women, um, it, you know, comes off as a as an attack on men. I just think it's ridiculous. And 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 from the beginning of my work in 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 this area, which is, you know, I started when I was a nineteen year old university student, so it's a long time. Um, I've always understood that men's violence against women was a gigantic global catastrophe. It's ongoing, it's been thousands of years, and it's certainly right up to the present moment, but it's also directly linked to men's violence against women, excuse me, to men's violence against other men, men's violence against themselves. In other words, the, the idea that somehow men's violence against women is a, is, a, is a phenomenon that's sort of disconnected from all these other systems that affect men directly is, is silly. It's just silly, it's, it's, it's ignorant. It, and, and so from the beginning of my uh, engagement with this subject matter, it was always like, how do we reduce violence? How do we increase equality? How do we increase justice in the world? And, and that's racial justice, it's gender justice, it's sexual justice. And what role can those of us who, are, who happen to occupy positions of social advantage, um, whether it's men in a patriarchal society, white people in a racist society, um, heterosexual or heteronormative people in a, in a world in which, you know, discrimination, harassment and violence against LGBTQ uh, people is, is normalized, if you will. How do, how do people who are occupying the social position of relative advantage participate in pursuing justice and fairness and, and, and in the case of men, reducing violence and reducing definitions of manhood and masculinity and masculinities that contribute to this ongoing problem, obviously, a huge problem, men's violence against women. You know, unto itself, that's a huge problem, but it's, it's, it's also linked to all these other problems. And, and so to, to get to the men's health piece of it, I mean, how do we define health? I mean, health is broadly understood, right? And, and let me just say, you know, just to, to, to make sure I say, you know, make sure I remember to say this, there's a women's health movement that started in the early 1970s in my home city of Boston, really, was one of the epicenters of it. It was they, on the, the publication of the, the, the book, uh, Our Bodies, Ourselves, in, I believe, 1972 or so, was a major moment in the, what's called the women's health movement. And the women's health movement was, was an attempt to understand the ways in which women's health, physical, uh, psychological, sexual, you know, reproductive health, the whole range of health issues that women deal with, um, we're not just biologically, uh, uh, you know, sort of predetermined or it wasn't just about their biology. It was also socially constructed. There were ways in which being a woman in a sexist society or a patriarchal society um, 
affected women's both health outcomes and then, you know, and the ways that they interact with the health care system and everything else. And it's this is basic feminism 101. OK, so understanding the ways in which gender affects women's health. Well, there's a men's health movement that grew out of the women's health movement that is much smaller and still in its relatively early stages. And it's the men's health movement is an attempt to look at the ways in which men's health have been affected, but has been affected by cultural ideologies and beliefs about manhood and masculinities across various categories of socioeconomics, race, ethnicity, global north, global south. I mean, it's complicated. When you start looking at this stuff, it's, it gets complicated. But the basic point is that men's health is directly affected, as is women's health, by gender norms and gender ideologies. And um, the, the, m- some of the major figures in the men's health field directly credit feminist-led women's health pioneers and women's health advocates for creating the intellectual architecture and social support and political advocacy around gendering health. I'll give you, I'll just give you one example. So, I mean, and and by the way, one of the reasons why I'm saying this is because some men and some women and people who aren't men or women who are ignorant of any of this history will say, well, well, you know, what about men's health? Men have all these health issues and these feminists, all they care about is women. It's like, this is so ignorant. Okay. I'm, I'm, I keep saying that I'm sorry, but it's just, it's just, it's just, they don't know what they're talking about. So the, um, Terry Real, who's a you know friend and colleague of mine, who's a therapist and an author, and he's a brilliant guy. He wrote his first book is called um, "I Don't Want to Talk About It: Overcoming the Secret Legacy of Male Depression." It was published in 1997, and it's brilliant—a brilliant book about men's emotional and relational health. It's a little bit focused on white men, um, to the you know to the if you will to the ex- not to the exclusion of, but not to the focus of the complexities of race and ethnicity beyond white men, but it's, it's 1997. It's brilliant insight into, into men's emotional and psychological uh, health. And um, Terry argues that um, something like three quarters of American men, now he's American, um, suffer from what he refers to as covert depression. Not something that would get sort of diagnosed or put men into or, or, or get, you know, men would need to check into some kind of facility or be medicated or what have you for. But but that just millions, tens of millions of men walk around with uh, covert depression that they self-medicate against with, you know, alcohol, with, you know, other drugs, with food, with workahol, workaholism. In other words, not to not deal with the underlying issues. And Terry, among others, you know, just openly says that his ideas about men's health and men's depression and, and, and his powerful advocacy is directly indebted to feminist women's insights about gender and gender as an operating system that affects everybody. And so the idea that somehow it's one or the other, that we care about either women's health or men's health, or we're either feminist or we're, or we're, we're, we're you know, or, we're, we, or we care about men, it just, these are silly distinctions and divisions that we need to get beyond. So my understanding about, you know, men's violence against women um, as, a, as a men's health issue is connected to all of the, the way that to look at all of this holistically, rather than just somehow we can separate out um, one form of abuse or harassment from the larger picture of how gender operates in our societies and in the world. Absolutely. I totally agree. Like the intersection and how it all pulls together. There was um, something really interesting that I picked up that you said a lot. You said so many things, and there's so many threads that could um, be pulled. One of the things that you mentioned um, was the defensiveness, the defensiveness that has that happens when we start to talk about things like gender-based, or sorry, well, gender-based violence. I know that's not a term that you uh, that you endorse, which is also something we can talk about in a bit. But also, when we start to talk about this and we start to open up, there's a defensiveness by men and women. Um, a lot of things that I personally hear a lot in my practice when we start talking about it and we start talking about the disproportionate. So here in Alberta, we know that um, we we currently um, finished a study, first Canadian or first Albertan study since 1984. 
um, in the last year. And we know that one in two women before the age of 18, and um, so approximately 44% actually. And we know that one in four men will experience sexual violence before the age of 18, right? We know this is, we know it's gendered. And when we start to talk about it, the first thing that comes out is what about the men? What about the men? Um, so do you want to speak a little bit more about that defensiveness, all of the things that comes with that? Sure. I mean, one of the one, one piece of this, Chris, is, um, is, is, is about language. I mean, and I, I've written and, and, and spoken about language for, for a long time, and it's really important to think about how we think about this subject matter because um, language structures thought. And I'll just give you, I'll give you a handful of examples. And I'll bring it, bring it all back to your point. But I mean, I think the, 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 the if we're going to get to a new way of thinking about this subject, I think one of the ways of getting there is to think critically about how we're currently thinking and, and, and the way in which the, our use of language around this subject matter keeps us in what I would refer to as an old paradigm or, or a, a, you know, an old way of uh, thinking. So, so, so here's a handful of examples of how we're currently talking about um, gender violence. And I, I'll use the term, you know, gender violence. Um, you'll hear people say things like how many women were in, in Alberta or in Canada were sexually assaulted last year, rather than how many men sexually assaulted women, or how many girls in the Calgary or the Edmonton, you know, school district were sexually harassed last year, rather than how many boys sexually harassed girls, or how many girls sexually harassed girls. You'll hear people say things like how many teenage girls in the province of Alberta got pregnant last year, rather than how many men and boys impregnated teenage girls. I mean, even the term violence against women is a term that I don't, I don't use because what's missing from the term? Well, violence against women is a passive phrase. There's no active agent in the sentence. It's, all, it's almost like a, a bad thing that happens to women, but nobody's doing it to them. They're just kind of experiencing it like the weather, right? But if you insert the active agent, men, you have a new phrase, men's violence against women. It doesn't roll off the tongue as easily, but it's more accurate and it's more honest. And what ends up happening is without using this active language, all this passive voice, all this gender neutral discussion, we then in this subsequent discussion, we don't really talk about the real, the heart of the matter, which is gender. The heart of the matter is gender norms and how boys and men growing up are taught certain ways of being a man, certain sexual entitlement, certain prerogatives in, relation, in a relational context, certain narratives about how to achieve manhood through the use of violence or the threat of violence, not just in relation to women, but in relation to other men. I mean, we don't, we don't talk about any of that. We talk about secondary factors, which are important, but they're not central. Gender is the central factor in violence. Now, when it comes to men's defensiveness, I mean, it's... It, it's a related point, but I mean, this is what happens when you start challenging existing power structures in any way, you're going to get pushback. I mean, it's like white people and racism. There's, there's very direct analogy between how some white people respond to the idea that white people are contributing to racism uh, and, and such a thing as systemic racism um, and, and men responding to um, you know, challenges about sexism. Men will say, it's not me. I don't do anything. Why am I, you're calling me a sexist? You're calling me a racist? I'm not a racist. I'm not a sexist. This is, again, this is so sh shallow in its understanding of what, what sexism is or what racism is and what, and what role people play in it. It doesn't, like, for example, with racism, just because if you're a white person, just because you don't, you know, burn crosses, you know, and, and, and put stupid hoods over your head and, and, you know, and march in, you know, with to tiki torches at Charlottesville, you know, and or paint swastikas on people's, you know, you know, fences and stuff. You're not a racist because a racist is somebody who does that. But I'm not a racist. So therefore, nothing about, you know, sort of structural racism. You, you, you don't want to think about any way in which you might be part of that system. So you just deny it. It's like in, and, 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 and you get angry because you don't want to really be introspective. This is so predictable. Okay. This is, and this is what happens by the way, with members of dominant groups all over and it's all over the world too. It's not, I mean, I'm talking about North America. So we're talking about certain kinds of racial hierarchies and gender hierarchies, but there's hierarchies all over the world. And there's different ways in which members of dominant groups resist introspection, self-awareness, and then, of course, the changes that they would have to make if they were truly believing in what they say they believe in. So if you, for example, if you say you believe in justice and fairness and equality, 
and you're a white person, but you're not working for justice and fairness and equality. You're just going about your life. And, and other people are saying, people who are going about their life, who are members of dominant groups in the face of all of this racism or sexism or heterosexism, people who are just going about their lives and not actively involved in what they understand to be perpetuating the problem, but, but, they're, but they also don't do anything actively to change the society or to, or to undermine the abusive sort of structures, then in a sense, their inaction is a form of consent and complicity with the ongoing status quo. And there's, there's a, the, the path of least resistance in all this is just to put your head down and say, it's not my issue. I'm not, what are you talking about? It's not really my, you know, my concern. And this is, this is how a lot of men respond to sexism and, and, and the issue of men's violence against women. They'll, they'll say, I don't rape women. I don't beat my girlfriend. Um, it, it, why is this my issue? You know, and it's it's again, it's very similar. Like I said, anytime anytime you use a racial analogy, it, 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 I think it makes it a little more clear how silly that that statement is. If you're not working actively to support gender justice and gender equality and reducing men's violence against women and you're a man, then in a sense, you are helping to perpetuate the status quo. Now, the the the, the argument, what about men? What about violently say violence against women? That, number one, that's a what about ism argument, because if the focus is on women, like, like, let's talk about women. This is not about men. It's about women. Now, you can say we can focus our attention on men. But if the focus is on men's violence against women, it's not the focus should not be on men's experience of pain and suffering. That's important to talk about. And there's other forms for it. But that's a what about is argument that shifts the discussion back off of women and puts it onto men, which is a form of narcissism and a form of privilege. It's just, it's just inappropriate. Now I do think it's important, as I said, in my, in the first, you know, question to answer, <coughs> it's important to link these issues because they are linked. I mean, men's violence against women is linked to men's violence against other men. I mean, if we're going to talk by the way about violence, with the exception of sexual violence and domestic violence, men are the primary victims of most major forms of violence. I mean, when it comes to murder, attempted murder, assault, aggravated assault, gay bashing, bullying, men are the primary victims of all those crimes, as well as the primary perpetrators of all those crimes. And so if you really care about men, I mean, you would you would listen to the to women, for example, and the feminist women, whether it's in the domestic and sexual violence movements or elsewhere, who've been talking for decades about all of this, who've been saying for decades that we have to critically examine how we identify, you know, how we uh, define manhood and and power and control and, and and socialize boys because women are harmed dramatically, but men are also harmed by this. And by the way, one one further point: suicide. Okay, so, so in the United States, right, we have this, as you know, enormous problem of gun violence. It's, it's pathetic, and it's, it's, it's like a global shame on the country for, you know, it's, it, you know, it's just unbelievable how much gun violence there is in the United States that people just are so desensitized to, so many people are so desensitized to. What, what, most people, what many people don't know is out of the 32 or 35,000, depends on how you, you know, count it, gun deaths per year in the United States, something like two thirds of them are suicides. And the vast majority of suicide by gun, I don't know if it's 80%, but it's a vast majority of suicide by gun is done by men. And the fastest growing category of gun suicide in the United States is white men over the age of 50. What I've been saying, and, and, and I'm not original in saying this, but I've certainly been saying this, is that the same system that produces a, a 20 year old you know, university student who rapes his fellow college student is the same system that produces a 29 year old guy who beats up his pregnant wife because he's freaked out about the, you know, the, the growing responsibilities and her, his wife's you know, shifting of her uh, focus to the, you know, to, the, to the fetus growing inside her away from him is the same system that produces a 37 year old you know, manager in a, you know, in a, in a restaurant to sexually, sexually harasses his, you know, colleagues or employees. It's the same system that produces a 47 year old corporate executive who's, uh, you know, sexually coerces, you know, members of his, you know, or subordinates on his staff is the same system that produces a 63 year old white guy who goes up in the, in the, in the woods outside of Edmonton and shoots himself in the head. It's the same system. And, and thoughtful people make this connection. My friend and colleague, Michael Kaufman, who's one of the 
co-founders of the White Ribbon Campaign, started in Canada, and it became a, a you know the first major international global movement of men, you know, public sort of publicly announcing that they were going to no longer going to commit or condone men's violence against women. The White Ribbon Campaign, which was in response to the Montreal Massacre in 1989, 1991 is when the White Ribbon Campaign started. Um, uh, Michael Kaufman wrote an article in 1987, it was called The Triad of Men's Violence. Okay, 1987 is not yesterday, okay, it's been decades. The triad of men's violence, Michael Kaufman articulated, was men's violence against women, men's violence against other men, men's violence against themselves. In other words, sophisticated people make the connections between all. So the, the very statement, what about men, means that that person is unaware that there is a way of thinking that connects them all already and has been around for decades. So part of what we need to do is be better as educators because because we, we've known a lot of this for for a long time look around you know I'm, I, I I often refer to my office as a as a museum because because you know it's paper heavy if you will there's there's lots of books you know like a physical book that you pick up in your hand and you hold as opposed to the technology of the of more um, more recent vintage uh, where everything's digital. But um, there's a lot of knowledge that we have, and there's a, there's a ton of knowledge that we've generated over the past generation about all of this subject matter. Um, by the way, one just one one other reference for anybody who's interested, the the man Will Will Courtney. He's another one of the pioneers of the men's health movement. His book "Dying to Be Men" is an incredibly useful resource. Like it's filled with, packed with references to the various research and studies that have been done over the past, you know. 25, 30 years about men's health and the connection between cultural beliefs about masculinities, again, crossing class and race and ethnicity in complicated ways, and men's health and health outcomes. And Will Courtney is another one of those men who would credit feminist women with being the, you know, the architects, the, the leaders of this way of thinking that is so beneficial to men, which again defeats the idea that somehow it's anti-male to talk about any of this or that feminists, what they're doing is somehow anti-male. That's, that's, you know, that's like such predictable, ignorant kind of uh, talk, but I appreciate that's where people who don't know the subject matter, who don't understand these connections, who haven't read these books, who haven't been exposed to this way of thinking, you know, often will go, will, will go in that direction. Thanks, Jackson. Um, just so everyone knows in the chat, we had a bit of like uh, a little um, Zoom bombing happening. Those people have been um, asked to leave. So um, we we'll, that will be cleaning up. Um, Jackson, you know, you talk a lot about it being a system. And, you know, I think um, that that one piece probably really hit home. Um, that one piece really hit home probably for the people that are in the community of Medicine Hat. We've lost um, a series of young men recently to suicide. Um, and so when we start thinking about that, the same system that creates violence, uh, men's violence against women, I'm gonna work really hard to correct that language over time. Um, but the same system that creates um, vi men's violence against women and then men's violence against other men and then men's violence towards themselves so what is that system? That's a great question. I mean, in, in a word, it's patriarchal culture. It's, 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 it's male dominant culture that um, we, from the earliest moments of a child's life, uh, we socialize them into certain identifications, certain narratives about gender that have enormous impact on their life cho chances and outcomes. And, you know, and, and one of the long-term feminist projects is to break down these artificial ways that we define, like that we take human babies and assign certain characteristics to certain babies based on their, you know, genitals, you know? And, and so for example, all the, all the most important qualities, I think of, of humanity are not gendered qualities. They're, you know, like the things that I aspire to and that I aspire for my, you know, child or others to have is, you know, in terms of their, their being, their character, it's compassion, it's a, a sense of fairness and justice, it's empathy, 
these aren't these aren't gendered qualities, but yet in the gender in the gender system in the in the in the old school sort of binary system, we have masculine and feminine, and we assign certain individuals with certain biology <laughs> this set of characteristics and say this is what they're supposed to evidence if they are born you know male if you will, and this is you know the certain characteristics if they are born female, which is so limiting both to women and to men, and and so I think for ex for example I think some of the reasons why so many men have, you know, emotional and mental health challenges that sometimes result in suicide. I mean, that's a more extreme version. That's, that's violence turned, you know, inward. Um, is because they don't have the tools to navigate the complex emotions that human beings face because because the gender culture has l so limited their ability to feel and express and identify a range of emotions. I mean, so, for example, so many men can't are so emotionally illiterate and by the way i'm not i'm not saying that i'm some guy who's figured this all out like for myself like that is i'm um, somehow is fully evolved human being that's ludicrous i mean i think i'm smart enough to know some of these things it doesn't mean that i have it all <laughs> figured out in my own you know life and my own emotional and psychological life as well as my intellectual life i mean but i think a lot of men are so emotionally illiterate that they can't even identify feelings they have they have feelings but they, what, they, what they often do is they transfer an, a complex emotional experience, especially ones that involve vulnerability. They transfer that to, to anger because, because anger, number one, is easy. They can identify anger. And number two, they can express anger. And they're allowed to express anger because anger, the expression of anger is not inconsistent with the gender prescription for men that you're not allowed to feel various emotions so for example there but they are allowed to feel anger so for example men who feel vulnerable like so so the, the the feeling of vulnerability like i'm i feel helpless i don't know what to do things aren't going well i don't know how to resolve this conflict in my own psyche in my own relationship whatever the the and I feel like a failure i mean i feel disappointed in myself other people are disappointed in me i feel terrible what some men do is they transfer all this sort of f these feelings that are vulnerable in a culture that teaches them that a real man doesn't feel those things. A real man banishes those thoughts and those feelings. A real man sucks it up. A real man, you know, just takes care of business. You know, you get issues. Everybody's got issues. You got to suck it up. And, 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 um, and then transfers it into either self-loathing because they feel these things and they, they don't have permission to feel these things or they feel helpless. Um, and they, they don't know how to, reach out for to ask for help because they see somehow that that, that even the act of reaching out for help pr proves what a loser they are or what ha you know i'm using the word loser in quotes because it's a, it's so silly um and by the way the fact that the united states elected donald trump let me just let me just go there in 19 in 2016 the fact that you know I don't know what it was, 68 million people or something like that back in 2016 voted for him and then after 4 years of his manifest malignant narcissism and incredible insecurity and and dysfunctional behavior and, and abusive behavior on so many levels 74 million people voted for him after that shows you how far we have to come in terms of dealing with some of this stuff i mean some of us looked at him i mean i'm t i'm talking about years before he was president i mean he was a caricature of traditional white heterosexual masculinity like literally a caricature people would use like donald trump as an example of some sort of cartoon of 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 how bad it could be a white a heterosexual white man could be in terms of his ability to address the, the 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 modern moment of you know what it means to be uh, you know empathetic human being and relational and 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 uh, you know i mean really and then the but the point is we still have in our societies lots of people who are bought into the idea that strength in men looks something like that i mean i i look at like donald trump and say strength are you kidding me if if, if you're if you're a man who can't admit weakness you can't admit when you make a mistake because if you admit you make a mistake you're going to be sh revealing your weakness this is by definition not strong that's what a strong man would say i made a mistake i screwed up i'm going to do better next time because they're confident they're secure i mean but what i'm saying matter of factly is not understood broadly <laughs> i mean there's still millions of people who are invested in the old way of thinking 
And that's true in Canada um, as well. Maybe maybe a little less so in Canada, but certainly a lot of people in Canada are invested in that in that uh, uh, you know uh, performance uh, of a certain kind of manhood. And so I think part of the issue for for men, and cer- certainly for men who are feeling or who are experiencing whether it's depression or um, or or other mental health challenges, and this is n- not a new statement. What I'm making, and I know your your project has. In, address this and other people have addressed this for now for a number of years i mean decades really um is that it's not an act of you know sort of weakness whatever that means to ask for help it's just it's it's an act of you know integrity it's an act of care it's an act of self-care and it's an act of care for the people around you because the people around you are concerned about you and yet you have to you have to take a step as well you know and 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 saying that it, it, it's okay it's okay to be vulnerable it's okay to be to to feel sad or to to not know what to do can i also say chris one one interesting i think um phenomenon that's counter to what i'm saying about the um the lack of um social permission for men to experience emotional vulnerability and other forms of sort of um disappointment and what have you is AA and NA, like uh, Alcoholics Anonymous, Narcotics Anonymous, you'll see all over the uh, North America, you'll see men and women, I mean, and people who aren't men or women, but I'm focusing on the men, who will sit in a room every day and night in Alberta and everywhere, right? And they'll say, my name is, you know, Jim, I'm an alcoholic and a drug addict. And I just, you know, screwed up my life. And I'm here and I'm, you know, and I'm so happy to be here, but, you know, life has been really rough for me. And people don't say, oh, you're weak, you're soft, you're a pussy. Pardon me. They'll say, it's great you came here, Jim, and you're in a, you're in a supportive environment and we all know exactly where you're coming from. And they're not shamed for feeling vulnerable. And so there, is a, there are those spaces, but, but in the larger culture, we haven't gotten there yet. There's still an awful lot of performance, an awful lot of men who are still invested in, I got it all. I've got it, I got it going on. Hey, yeah. Yeah. How you doing? I'm doing good. How you doing? How's the family? Good. Meanwhile, like turmoil is all over the place in this person's life. But but the public performance is. Now, and by the way, can I also say, I understand, believe me, I understand that there's places where you're supposed to be and you need to be keeping a stoic face. I mean, in other words, I'm not saying everybody needs to walk around all the time, you know, expressing their vulnerability. That's not what I'm saying or anybody's saying. But but I am because there are places where you have to and you do, you know, keep keep a stoic front. I mean, for example, adults need to take care of children and adults need to prioritize the needs of children vis-a-vis adults, professionals, like whether it's law enforcement, military, you know, first responders, doctors, you know, nurses. I mean, people who are taking care of people who are really, you know, sick, vulnerable, injured, what have you need to be. They have to be stoic. They have to be, you know, professional, if you will. I'm not saying that in every state st- stage of your life you have to be, you know, um, you know, uh, you know, vulnerable or expressing vulnerability. But in a general sense, if we don't allow for men to have a range of emotional experiences um, and not shame them for doing that, um, then we're going to get what we get, which is huge dysfunctions, huge numbers of men who are acting out both against others and against themselves and or, li- or living lives of quiet desperation. And by the way, feminists have been saying this for 50 years. And every time when feminists get bl- you know, accused of being anti-male, I say, you, you just have no idea what you're talking about. Like you have just have no idea what you're talking about. And I'm writing a book right now. I mean, it's a masculinities and violence. And, and I have a whole, the first chapter, in fact, after the introduction, the, the first chapter is devoted to how much insight we've gained over the past half century from, you know, from the battered women's movement and the sexual assault movements about men and men's and, and ideologies of manhood and how dysfunctional they have been both to women and to men themselves. I'm going to be really excited to read that book, just so you know, you. Uh, get really excited. Um, So I do have a question here that's popped up from um, one of our participants that I think just leads, just it's appropriate just to ask it right now, which is why is it acceptable for men to express anger when they are vulnerable, but when women express it, they are shamed or repressed, et cetera. So it's like some, some 
emotions are okay for women and some emotions are okay for men and it doesn't translate across. Right. Because that's how the system of, you know, I hate to use jargon, but that's how patriarchal power works because women's anger is threatening to the, to the system of women's second class status because anger is a threatening emotion to the status quo. And, and, you know, if, if women are angry and expressing that anger, that disrupts the power arrangements in this in the in the society. Men's vulnerability disrupts patriarchal power. Women's anger disrupts patriarchal power. Therefore, both of them are policed against. There's all kinds of, you know, and individuals aren't thinking about this. When an individual says, you know, man up or or gets angry at a woman for getting angry, that individual isn't not necessarily aware or cognizant of how they're reinforcing or playing the role of enforcer of patriarchal values and ideologies. They're not thinking consciously that that's what they're doing, but that's what they're doing. I mean, and so, so, so this is, this is why it's not, it's, 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 it, if you understand how structures work, you understand that, that certain kinds of emotions are acceptable because they perpetuate the existing structures. If they undermine the existing structures, they have to be policed against. They have to be shunned. They have to be ridiculed or dismissed. This is what it is. This is what's going on. So basically we're using shaming to keep the system in place is what I'm hearing, right? Like, so we'll yeah, shame shaming is one way, to, one way to put it. And by the way, the, the, the word shame is critical in discussions about men's violence because, I mean, if you look at the work of James Gilligan, I don't know if anybody's heard of James Gilligan, but James Gilligan, who happens, let me just say, to be married to Carol Gilligan, who Carol Gilligan is one of the founders, literally, of the field of women's psychology. Um, and I had her as a professor in grad school, I have to say, with, uh, with pride. Um, but uh, James Gilligan is, you know, retired psychiatrist. At one point in his life, he was the director of sort of psychiatric services at, at, a, at, 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 at a hospital in Massachusetts for the, what they used to be called the criminally insane, right? And so for 20 years, he was in charge of the medical, you know, professional in charge of this, this population of men, mostly, overwhelmingly, I think it was all men, but who were, many of whom brutal, had commit, committed brutal crimes of violence. And he wrote two books coming out of his sort of experience and knowledge about the clinical sort of knowledge, but, but in a broader context, one of them is called uh, violence <laughs> and one of them is called preventing violence. And, and what he identified as the single most important factor in men's violence was, was shame. The, the, the experience of shame and the use of violence to resolve that feeling of shame. And so it, and one of the things that he said, for example, you'll often hear people say things like in, a, in response to a, a brutal act of violence, you know, whether it's a mass shooting or something, they'll say, what a senseless act of violence that was on, uh, you know, sent. and his argument is it's not senseless. If you under, it's horrible, but it's, if you understand what's going on in the psyche of the perpetrator, it makes perfect sense. It's logical and rational based on his assessment of his state and how violence is understood by him to be a strategy for gaining back some wholeness or what have you, or responding to some shame. So shame is a critical, uh, is a critical force. I'm not, now I'm talking about the extremes of shame, but, but I think anybody who's interested in the concept of shame should read James Gilligan. It's brilliant stuff. Beautiful. And yes, I will. <laughs> and yes, I will. Um, just kind of stepping back a little bit, I, you know, I've had, I've read your work, I've listened to it, I've watched some of your things, um, and I know that you have extensive experience working with the military, and extensive exp experience working with the military, talking about the very things that you're talking about, which is violence, which is vulnerability, all of the things. How do we, so now that we've talked about it, how do we actually create how do we set the stage and open the door for change to happen? <laughs> That's a tough, I mean, it's a good question, but it's a tough question. I mean, I guess there's many layers to this. I mean, many layers. I mean, I'll just take, you know, I'll just try what I can, you know, to, in response. Um, the change has to be um, institutional and not just individual. Like people who say, for example, change happens one person at a time. 
No, it, it doesn't, to be honest with you. That's not how change happens. Change has to happen systematically. Now, individuals have to have a role and feel like they have a role to play because if you start talking about abstract, big concepts like, you know, transforming patriarchal cultures and capitalism and, you know, and, you know, the military. I mean, it's like, it's so overwhelming that people just totally, you know, are, are immobilized. And so I'm not, I don't want to, I don't want to do that, but it change does not happen one person at a time. I mean, if you do the math, okay, we have like 8 billion people in the world. If change happens one person at a time, how many like millennia is it going to take to address some of these issues? Right. I mean, it's, it's, it's got to be systematic. In other words, the change that has to happen has to be institutional and political. It has to be about resource allocation, you know, like a budget, for example, like a provincial budget is a moral document. Martin Luther King said that it's a moral document. It shows what the province or what the country or what the municipality values and what it doesn't value or the hierarchy of what it cares about and what's what it's concerned about and who has power to determine that hierarchy. So, for example, we have the resources in the, in the global north and co wealthy countries like the United States and Canada. We have the resources to put behind massive, better mental health services. And in the United States, basic health services for, you know, that everybody should have as a being a, a human being, not just, you know, because you can afford it. You know, I mean, I mean, we're way behind in that regard. Um, by the way, that's also linked to rugged individualist ideology, which is gendered ideology. The, the, you know, the, the American ideology of like, you know, you just you make it on your own. You know, you don't self-reliance. You don't You know, community is for weak, weak people. You know, the individual is what really counts. This is all gendered, highly gendered stuff. And it's one of the reasons why we don't have health care in the United States for, you know, as a right of, uh, you know, citizenship or, or, or living in this country. Um, so system, systems have to change, institutions have to change, political priorities have to change, people have to organize to push systems to respond, because we could do this. I mean, we could, like, for example, in the, in the education system, I'll give you another example, education system, right? Every person who's going through university, who's going to be a teacher, who's going to be a secondary ed administrator, you know, should have training on all of this, should have training on gender, you know, and fe feminist ideas. And you don't have to agree with everything. You can uh, disagree. You can, you can have different points of view. Even the term feminism is wildly, you know, diverse. There's so many different uh, angles to feminism. I mean, even using the word feminism as a singular is, uh, is, is short-sighted. It's a, uh, there's radical feminist, socialist feminist, liberal feminist, echo feminist, you know, there is even some conservatives who, con who consider themselves feminist. Feminism is much bigger than a specific social movement. It's a much, it's a tectonic shift in human civilization. Um, anyhow, um, if you're a, a, a teacher or an educational administrator or going to be one, you should have all this in your coursework, in your in undergraduate and graduate school. You should know all about the relationships between gender and, 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 and intersection with race and ethnicity, you know. Um, from First Nations to, you know, wealthy white communities, this should be part of everybody's understanding. You, you, need, you, you, should, you should know all about the, how much gender violence and how much sexual assault and sexual harassment and, and relationship abuse and domestic violence occurs not just in teen relationships, but children who are growing up in families with these kinds of problems, how that affects their educational um, success or or the likelihood of success because they're bringing with them to school all kinds of emotional and relational issues that are going to impede their ability to be educated successfully. You need to know all this. You don't need to be an expert. I can't, I'm not saying that, but you do need to know all this, but yet go to the graduate schools of education throughout the province of uh, Alberta or go to the undergraduate education and see how rarely this stuff is prioritized. Now, it doesn't mean that there aren't people teaching it. There are. There are individuals teaching courses or individuals where modules in courses will engage with the subject matter. But you can still, I, I can't speak to Alberta specifically, but you can still graduate from, the, in the United States, from universities all, and colleges and universities all over the United States with degrees, you know, undergraduate degrees, and in many cases, graduate degrees, never having taken courses where you engage with the subject matter. And yet, and yet consider yourself educated. And, and in schools of education in particular, I got my PhD at um, UCLA, which is, you know, prestigious, top-notch school of education. And um, you could graduate from UCLA with a PhD, not even an undergraduate degree, with a PhD and never have taken 
courses mandated. I'm saying, you know, like that was part of your uh, normative educational requirement on this kind of subject matter. You could just grab, you could, you know, to me, that's just unbelievable. And, 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 and that's a structural thing. That's an institutional thing. That's not about individuals. That's about structures. And, 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 and by the way, one of the ch big challenges in working with men is that unless you make this stuff normative, like, and expected, the only men who are going to get involved are the ones who are already generally speaking, I'm making a general statement, who are already somewhat checked in to all of this or supportive or sensitive or whatever term you want to use. Good for them. But that's not how you make structural change by in, volunteers helping out. It's, it's got to be built into systemic processes. And that means power and it means going right into the heart of the decision making process and, and making it everybody has to do it. So for example, imagine if every man at, a, at every university and college in Alberta was required, I mean, every person, I mean, it's not just every man, it would be every person was required to take courses that address this subject matter. Think about all the men who would never, ever have signed up for a course voluntarily that was a gender studies course, a, a feminism course, a women's studies or sexuality studies. They would never have signed up voluntarily. But if it becomes part of the educational um, requirement that everybody takes a course where the, the subject of gender justice, gender equality and stuff like that was, was the center of the course and everybody had to take it. Think about all the men who would walk through that door who would never have walked through that door and then think about how much they would learn. Like for example, some of the things that I've been saying today, which I, I just, I think is matter of fact, but, but is radical to a lot of people who've never heard it. And, and, and think about all the guys who you wouldn't think in a million years would be supportive. Those guys, oh my God, a lot of those guys, and, and I've worked with guys, men for years, and my colleagues and I've worked with men in the sports culture, in the military, and in all these blue collar and up, you know, upper class sort of communities. So it's everywhere across the board, racially diverse. You have no idea how many men I've worked with and my colleagues have worked with who look the part of the traditional man, who once they've been exposed to some of this are like transformed. I'm like, oh my God, that you wouldn't guess by looking at them, but then, um, but, but believe me, this is what's going on in part because they, they've now been exposed to a way of thinking. They've been given the tools to both conceptually and the permission to go, to go there. I, I have no doubt that if you did something like that institutionally, like, you know, in terms of the, I'm just now talking about academia, that's, there's other places too, but the change that has to happen would happen much more quickly. And, and the, the, the movements against all of this stuff, whether it's the men's rights movement or right-wing movements more generally, the alt-right, the, you know, the, 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 the white nationalist movements and everything else would be completely undermined in their ability to attract young white men because those young white men would have a whole new way of thinking about all of this uh, rather than the one that so many of them have, which is we're being attacked. Western civilization is being attacked. We're going to defend white men and white male power and white male sort of centrality. And, and you know, this is all of this is totally predictable. I mean, I'm I, I watching it. I mean, I'm not wa just watching it. I'm also trying to actively work, you know, against that, you know, vision. But it's but when you look at it like the way in the way that I'm saying, it's 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 obvious why it's successful on some level, because a lot of these young white guys are just adrift and not knowing uh, who, who they are and what, you know, how to have a, a sort of positive meaning in life. And 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 the, the appeal of this, so these sort of movements, which which say to them, look, you're a white man, white men built Western civilization. You're being attacked. You need to defend your, your families, your communities, your your, you know, your uh, your ethnic identities. And that's a powerful and important and historical role for you to play. A lot of those men, in the absence of having any of these other more complicated understandings, it sounds attractive to them. And look, and by the way, we know which way that path leads. It's damage and destruction and violence and nothing good. Yes. 
just just to answer your question, actually in Alberta, very rarely is there a program where the courses you're talking about are mandated. They absolutely are options within them, um, or at least the ones that I've looked into or the ones that I've taken myself. And I did see some things popping up in the chat. Um, there's one thing that I think that I heard you say in a podcast that I thought was amazing. You said behavior is not learned, it's taught. I'm just, you know, maybe just like a few sentences on that and then we'll open up to questions because I think that leads right in or just springboards so nicely after what you just said. Sure. No, thank you. Yeah. I mean, people will often say in response to violence, the concept of where does violence come from? If it's, if it's not genetically predetermined or driven by testosterone or, you know, hormones, which is, I think, a ridiculous, I keep using, I know it's a little cheap to say ridiculous, and ignorant so often. So I, I, it's my, it's my failing. Um, but you can look, just look around the world, by the way, the rates of violence vary widely from one society to the next testosterone levels. Don't vary widely from one society to the next. You can look at the same society in different historical periods. There's different levels of violence. The testosterone level doesn't really vary that much. I mean, it's, it's, it's about social and economic and environmental factors way more than it is about biology. That's, that would, that's my point, but people will say in response to, okay, if it's not biology, if it's not genetics, then it must be learned behavior. And my argument is saying learned behavior is a passive way of putting it. If you say it's taught behavior, it shifts the onus of responsibility onto those of us who are teaching boys and men what it means to be a man. And that doesn't mean just individual parents or other adults in the lives of young people. It means the society, it means media, it means sports culture, religious beliefs. In other words, all the ways a society imparts its values to the next generation and its norms to the next generation is what needs to be under the critical spotlight because we continue to teach and, and, and guide boys and young men into ways of understanding themselves that lead to predictable outcomes like domestic violence, sexual assault, you know, you know, what, all kinds of other, you know, violence more generally. And how do we change that? So literally, as I said earlier, uh, Chris, the language piece is critical. Using active rather than passive language um, shifts our way of understanding what's right in front of us. And I think that's what we need to do. Agreed, totally agreed. Thank you, Jackson. We have a few questions that have popped up as times have been going. And if someone has a specific question, they can always pop it in the chat or send it straight to the Scenario Center if you'd like to be anonymous. And then we can ask. Um, so one of those questions, just making the shift, is um, this, the shaming for expressing emotions and vulnerability starts with boys when they are very young. This is all part of patriarchy. How can we allow them to be and express who they are? No, it's a good question. By allowing them to express and be who they are. <laughs> you know, it's by saying, by making it clear to parents, teachers, and caregivers who work with young people that when boys express vulnerability, not shaming them for it, not ridiculing them for it, not telling them to suck it up. You know, I mean, and by the way, this, I, this is another uh, sort of related to a, a really key point. I mean, in my book, I'm, I'm, my final chapter is about, and the book is not finished yet, but I mean, just the final chapter is about s strength. What does it mean to be strong? I mean, because you'll, you'll hear one of, the, one, of the, one of the ways that you'll hear some people objecting to what I've been saying is they'll say, Oh, you're just talking about making men soft, weak. You know, we, you know, you're, you're in the, in the, on Fox news channel. And I use news in quotes, um, in the United States, they, they, um, they use this term wussification, right? Like you're just trying to wussify America and boys and men. And which is a really misogynist term, by the way. It's like you're trying to make them into women. And which is another way of saying you're trying to undermine the strength of the country. Again, one of the reasons why Donald Trump was elected is because millions of people believe that, that, that our problems are that we're soft. The United States is soft um, and that we need to be tougher. So anyhow, <laughs> um, the, uh, the, imp the, underlying belief in of, of, the, of those people who would object to some of the things that I'm saying is that we're, again, undermining men's strength. And my argument is that's not at all 
what we're doing or what I'm saying. It's that we need to redefine what it means to be strong. And the, the idea that being strong means you're being, having the ability to impose your will on others through force or the threat of force, you know, for example, is such a limited understanding of strength. So what we, we have to expand our definition of strength to include moral courage, social courage, the ability, you know, the, 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 the willingness to say something even when your voice is shaking to, 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 to challenge or call out bullies or what have you. To Another thing, uh, another measure of strength in men is the ability to acknowledge vulnerability that's a strength not a weakness so if you're if you're going to say if you're an adult and you're going and a kid is a, a boy is evidencing some kind of vulnerability and you say suck it up be a man then you're contributing to his feeling ashamed to experience human emotion and and that doesn't lead anywhere good for that boy or for the people around him because what ends up happening is if that boy is shamed for feeling vulnerable then he's going to He's going to learn that vulnerability is a shameful emotion. He's going to hide it. And in some cases, he's going to, not all cases, I'm not saying there's a causal relationship, but in some cases, he's going to externalize his pain and hurt other people. And so, so much of what boys are trained to do is when they're feeling vulnerable and hurt, they take it out on somebody else. They, ex they express it against somebody else. When in fact, what's really going on is internal. And by the way, it, 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 girls are tra trained the opposite. Girls are trained to internalize their um, uh, shame. And, and so often girls will not externalize it, but they'll internalize it and they'll turn inward and they'll hurt themselves. They'll cut themselves. They'll put themselves in situations of greater vulnerability rather than boys externalizing. I mean, for example, how many school shootings are done by girls? I mean, in the United States, 99, over 99% of school shootings are done by boys. Are girls bullied, picked on, marginalized, harassed in school? Of course, but less than 1% of school shooters are girls. Why is that? Is You think might it have something to do with gender? <laughs> it might have something to do with the fact that we teach girls when they feel marginalized, uh, shamed, bullied, to take it out on themselves, and we teach boys to take it out on others? You think that might have something to do with the reason why 99% of school shootings? To me, it's the central, the, the single biggest reason why we have school shootings is gender, is the gender culture. But that doesn't get talked about. In the mainstream, it's always guns and mental illness. Guns, mental illness. And, and meanwhile, I, I, as I always say, I've been saying this for over 20 years, if it was guns and mental illness, then why aren't 50% of school shootings done by girls? Because it's not about guns and mental illness. It's about gender and masculinity in correlation with guns and the availability of guns, and then in some cases with mental illness. You know, but what gets left out is the gender piece. Yes, yes, very, very accurate. Um, so one of the, ne the next question on the list is, have you found that men are more or less defensive post the Me Too movement? I mean, it's hard to make a general statement about this, but I would say... I would say probably a little bit more defensive. And I would say the reason why I would say more is because there's more accountability. And so when you have accountability, there's going to be defensiveness. And especially when some of that accountability is retroactively enforced. So in other words, when men who have engaged in a certain kind of behavior, who have seen it as, and by the way, I'm not saying this is always an excuse. It's often true. It was normative to act in some of these ways in previous eras, previous decades, previous times. And now we're looking at it through the light of our 21st century lens and saying, oh my God, that is abusive behavior. When it was being engaged in, it was often not understood to be abusive as, as much as normative. This is where it gets really tricky because this, the reason why we have such big problems of domestic and sexual violence is because, the, the, because of how normalized abusive behavior has, has been, not because there's individuals with such deep pathology who go out and commit these horrible crimes, but because it's so marbled into normative practice, you know, men's entitlement, sexual entitlement, you know, prerogatives, relational prerogatives, you know, uh, emotional, you know, men's emotional needs get met first, if you will, sexual needs get met first if, in a sense. Some of this stuff has been so deeply sort of socialized and marbled into normative practice that 
that's why changing it and, and significantly reducing the violence means looking at these underlying beliefs and belief systems and institutional practices, not just running from one pathological individual to the next, trying to fix him or her, you know, this is why it gets really complicated, right? So there's defensiveness because partly the defensiveness is, um, like I said at the beginning, it's the easiest, it's the path of least resistance to be defensive, to either to deny the problem or to, or to be defensive in the face of it is easier than taking a deep breath and saying, wow, I really do have to look at my behavior or some of the things that we used to do and think, think thought it was normal really were kind of bad, you know, and, and not defensible. And I got to figure out how to do better. That, that, that's more complicated. And, and by the way, sometimes it's complicated because acknowledging that you did some of these things opens you to not just criticism, but also potential penalty. And, and, and sanctions and, and punishment. And who's, you know, who's rationally going to want to come forward if coming, if you will come forward, if coming forward means negative consequences. I mean, so, th so there's, it's, it's a really complicated, like you want men to look at their behavior, both today and in the past, myself included, in a, in a, in a critical light, but you also have to know that if the only way that they can, um, the only thing that's going to happen is that they're going to get negative uh, reaction and, and lose something and be punished for it. They're not going to willingly, you know, go down that road. So we have to figure out how do you, how do you reconcile these things? And it's, this is by the way, the, the United States is dealing with this with, with racism. I mean, with, with the historical uh, realities of the genocide of native peoples and the, uh, you know, uh, slavery, you know, uh, and, you know, African chattel slavery, which is a, such a formative part of this country. And you can see how, con how conflictual it is, because there's a certain group of people who are willing, white people, for, for example, who are willing to say, yes, this is the reality of our country. And we have to, we have to acknowledge that and do better. Same with, Can you know, Can Canada and First Nations people. And men in patriarchal culture, I mean, heteronormative people and the, the, the historic, you know, harassment, abuse, and violence done by men towards, and, and, and systems that are dominated by men towards people in the LGBTQ, you know, um, uh, c community, if you will. It's not going to go away. This is, this is, this is, these are decades and centuries worth of, of work to create better societies. And in the, in the course of that process, there's going to be a lot of pain and there's going to be a lot of accountability and there's going to be defensiveness and there's going to be push and pull and, 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 and nobody, I don't think can honestly say that we, it's all a work in progress that, that, that they've got to figure it out. It's all a work in progress. It's like, we're building the plane as we're flying it. It often feels like that actually as we're moving forward, doesn't it? <laughs> it totally feels like that actually. Um, one question is I'd like to hear Jackson's thoughts or advice on how we should try and engage pre-contemplative pre men on these issues. I hear the passion in his voice, but I also hear frustration. And I'm wondering how much of that he lets out in shows when talking with these dominant groups or with the people in his life who maybe aren't in a similar spot as, as you are. Well, thank you for the question. Um, it's a good, thoughtful question. I, I mean, I think everybody has to decide for themselves what role they play. I mean, I, I, I have my own sort of understanding of what I do. Everybody, not everybody is going to come down in the same place about how they can engage, you know, with, whether it's engaged with individuals or, or systems. I mean, I don't talk like this all the time to every person I talk to, like when I'm, you know what I'm saying? Like this is a, it, it, I, because of what your project is doing, unpacking, if you will, um, and talking honestly about men's health and masculinities and, and all these issues, I mean, that this seems like an appropriate forum to talk about some of the things that I'm talking about or in the way that I'm talking about it. But this is, you know, when I get together with like my family, I don't go, go off like this. You know what I mean? I mean, I always make this, you always make decisions about what's, what is your goal in a given, whether it's a social situation or an educational or professional situation, you always have to make decisions about what level you want to engage, what level you want to push people or pull back from pushing them. You know, you want to, 
sometimes maintain relationships. Sometimes maintaining relationships means you don't go certain places because you're just not going to be productive and you prioritize the, the maintenance of the relationship over making a point, you know, I don't, you know, in other, in other cases, you, 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 you know, you go right at it. So when I'm giving a speech, you know, like I'm in a public space and I'm giving a speech, I see my role as I'm making a political statement, if you will, even if the, even if it's not about, you know, partisan politics. I mean, it's a, it's a statement that when you're making it from the stage, this is, this should be said out loud. I'm saying it out loud. You can deal with it, et cetera. That's different than afterwards when I'm talking to people one-on-one, you know, I'm not giving them a speech, you know, I'm, I'm engaging with them. So I think everybody has to think contextually, like, what are you trying to accomplish? What is the relationship? What, who, what is your identity in that moment? And, and, and how do you, can you most effectively communicate what you're trying to accomplish? I mean, I, I think that's just good advice more generally, but that certainly as an educator, you have to think about that. Like what is your, as an, if you're an educator and not everybody's an educator, but if you're an educator, when you're going into a space, what is your, what is your goal? You know, what are you trying to re, what are you trying to accomplish? Who are the people? What are the, what's their level of consciousness? Generally speaking, what are you going to try to, in part or in a dialogic way or in a, in a presentation way, um, what are you going to try to accomplish? And then, and then try to stick to that because if you, if you, if you don't, if you misread in some way, you're not going to be as effective. Agree. And I would also like to add that a seed still would take time to germinate. Right. Um, And just patience. That's right. That's right. (laughs) <laughs> that's right super frustrating work it can be super frustrating work and and um you know walking away and just being like okay go let that germinate for a little while and tally ho <laughs> that's right um what can i say chris there's a there's a great uh, like a mexican proverb that i've heard and some people might have heard it but and i might get it wrong but it's something like they thought they buried us but we were seeds I like that a lot. Mm-hmm. And everybody, it's springtime in Alberta. We plant on May long weekend, just saying. <laughs> so watch your so your friends should be careful. No, I'm joking. <laughs> Couldn't help myself. Um, I like that very much. Um, so when the recently head of the Canadian military forces tells us that tells the troops that sexual relations with subordinates would not be tolerated, and when he has a 20 year relationship with a subordinate, how can we ever believe the superiors? When the defense minister was told that there were sexual allegations against the head of the forces, as he does not want to know or hear about them, how can, what can we expect from our elected officials? Big question. Sure. Well, I mean, this, Military leaders are not elected officials. So just to make the distinction, I mean, um, you can expect from elected officials, you should expect better. I mean, you should expect consistency. You should expect um, walking the talk, you know, and, and, and one of the benefits of democracy is that you have, uh, at least in theory and in, and in practice, you have the opportunity to elect leaders that, represent your values and if they don't then you have the opportunity to replace them with people who do and 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 you know democracy is a is an act it's not a it's like a verb and not a noun in in a in a sense you know what i mean like you have to do it you can't just be passive and 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 if 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 we were to hold our political leaders and elected officials accountable to doing what we and, and the we make, makes a difference too because not everybody agrees. I mean, in democracies, there's different points of view. I mean, some people don't agree with what I've been saying, or in certain measures, agree with some, don't agree with others. But in a democracy, you have to um, you have to organize and you have to um, try to elect people who will uh, represent the values that that at least in theory, a majority of the people. Um, support and if they don't then you need to replace them and and that's i mean it's it's in theory it's simple i mean in practice it's more complicated and difficult because power is very powerful you know people in power and systems in power have resources 
financial, social, and other resources to maintain their power. And so democracy is a constant struggle for whose voice matters and 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 who's going to represent us and the, and what is what is the us consist of all this is constantly being negotiated and and contested beautiful i just want to be really respectful of everyone's time um although i could hang out with you all day and ask you questions all day jackson and maybe there will be a chance for that in the future when covid is lifted um, i hope so <laughs> yeah, wouldn't that be amazing? Um, so I'm just going to ask you two more questions. Okay. If that's fair. Yep. Um, Joel asked, I agree with you on how this change needs to happen. However, do you worry that saying this change does not happen one person at, at a time gives some people nothing? Well, I, I appreciate the concern. I mean, it's both. Everybody has a role to play. But the, the real way that individuals can make the most change is by organizing with others to push systems to change. So individuals have, yes, there's a power in individuals. Individuals have, a, I mean, look, I mean, I, I feel like I am an individual, but I'm not just an individual. I'm an in individual working in systems. You know what I mean? And part of my work as an individual is with others and in a movement in a in organizational settings as an educator in systems so that's what i mean i mean everybody has a role to play and everybody has to think about what they can do and on the micro level interpersonal relationships interpersonally everybody and by the way should be walking the talk in other words if you're if you're somebody who believes in this larger change but then in your individual practice don't practice what you're preaching, if you will, or what you're advocating, then, you know, that's, that's hypocritical. And you want to align your individual behavior with your stated beliefs about what needs to happen as a, in the larger society. So I don't mean to say that individuals don't have a role. It's just that it's not, that's not the end all. Individual behavior is not the end all. It's, it's, it's got to be understood as part of a movement and part of a systemic change. And I, I would say for men, for example, who are interested in this work, don't just see it as you personally got to change your, the way that you talk to women or something, although that might be part of it. It's like, how can you get involved with organizations, with projects? How can you volunteer? In this case, we do need men who are willing to step forward. How do you, how do you connect with other men and men's organizations? Like next gen men is an example, you know, and in a local example for you all, especially, um, how can you get involved with that, with other men and women and others who are concerned about this subject matter? Um, because then you could have a multiplier effect. Because I think individuals brought, br brought together have a an exponential impact rather than individuals unto themselves. I love it. And that's why when we can, we meet so that we can absolutely hold space for that. And the very last question says, so much for joining us this morning. You've been doing this work for some time. Um, what have been some of your big wins? And then how do you remain hopeful? Thank you for the question. Uh, um, I mean, I don't know if, if, if I would say this is my big win, but it's certainly a, a collective big win. I just think there's an awful lot more men having this conversation today than we're having it when I was a young guy. And, and um, that's a big step forward. I mean, we, it's still a drop in the bucket in terms of the level of the problem, I have to say. I mean, in other words, the number of men who are engaged in initiatives like your unpacking masculinity or um, anything, I mean, you know, next gen men or any uh, initiatives that, that, that are uh, really focusing on men and men's engagement with this, you know, overall subject matter. It's important stuff and it's way, way more happening today than it was 20, 30, 40 years ago, but it's still nowhere near enough. I mean, we just need, we need much more. So, so what, what I'm, I guess what gives me hope is that we've made a lot of progress. I mean, I, I, again, I'm always tempered, tempering that optimism with a, you know, with a, you know, realism that, you know, we have so much further to go, but I think, um, I think we've made a lot of progress. And I think in my lifetime, even, um, there's measurable change. Uh, it's obvious. And, and, and by the way, some people who say, will say things like, 
well, change doesn't happen very fast. This has been really slow. Uh, you know, like we have so many problems and, you know, it's like, that's a, frankly, a historical point of view. It's like things have happened immensely fast over the past 50 years. I mean, if you look at the long march or the long journey of human civilization or, you know, homo sapiens, but certainly human civilization, 10,000 years of recorded history, 10,000 years. And, and before that, 100 to 150 to 200,000 years of our species alive on the planet. In the past 50 years, think about how fast things have changed. It's unbelievable in historical terms how accelerated the pace of change has been if you take a step back and look at it, the big picture. Um, and I'll give you just one example. I mean, look at the LGBT revolution, the LGBTQ revolution over the last, you know, 40, 50 years. I mean, I grew up, when I grew up, I graduated from high school. I had never met an openly gay person. Now, I had met many people who are gay or across the sexual orientation spectrum, if you will, but never an openly gay person until I was in college or university. Um, my son, by contrast, grew up with openly gay members of his family and his friendship circles, and, and, and it's just completely normal for him. And that's just in one generation, in one family. And, and, and by the way, one of the reasons why there's so much backlash, like the rise of Trump and the rise of these, you know, alt-right and all these other movements, white nationalists, the, part of the reason for all this is because the change has been so rapid and that people are, people are displaced by and, and psychically sort of um, uh, made very, very anxious and un uneasy by how fast things have been changing around gender and sexuality and, uh, and you know, feminism and, 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 and um, LGBT, obviously, and then racial and ethnic, you know, increasing diversity. Change is happening. The change is, so, so the part of the reason why I can maintain optimism is because I do take a long view and I think we're all part of the process. And I'm, you know, I think with one level, one way to think about it is how exciting it is to be part of, this historical moment that's where, where the change is just roiling and, and accelerating and you can be part of, part of something really exciting. So I, I, I personally think that's one of the ways that I maintain my optimism. And last piece, I just want to say, and I, I, I've said it in, in a way throughout my talk, but not enough, women's leadership and women's advocacy in a racially and ethnically and, and other ways, diverse sense, women's work has been the predicate for all of this and all these positive things that are happening in men's lives and men's emotional, psychological, sexual, physical health, violence, all these issues, all this stuff that's happening that's helping men be better human beings and have better families and better you know, relationships, better self-care. The single most important factor has been women's leadership and advocacy and in particular feminist women's leadership and advocacy. And, and I think it's important that men acknowledge this, men who do this kind of work, and say thank you and to women, you know, Chris and your colleagues and other women all over the world and in our lives and in the larger society. And because often, oftentimes those women don't hear that. And oftentimes they hear from men resistance, anger, hostility, um, as opposed to gratitude. And, um, and, and as I said right at the beginning, you know, if we're going to get men, if we're going to have healthier men, if we're going to have men who are more emotionally connected and relationally connected and successful in, in life, if you will, um, feminist women have pointed us in the right direction for the last half century or more, much more, but certainly in the last half century. And, uh, and we need more men who are willing to say that and willing to stand with them and partner with them and figure out how we could all be, you know, you know, better served. And, but, but, uh, but my final point is we can't pretend that we don't have a crisis on our hands of men's violence against women, children, and other men and themselves. We can't pretend that we live in, in some equal world. We don't, we live in a world of where male dominant societies are every society in the world and men's violence against women and children. And in this case is a, an ongoing tragedy and calamity and we need more men who have the courage and the strength to say that and do what they can to stop that and look at what's going on in men's lives as well but uh, i don't think it's one or the other as i've said throughout my uh, uh this 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 conversation i think it's both uh, but we can never lose sight of that piece and that the responsibility of men to address that issue of men's violence against women um is part of this larger picture so thank you and thanks for indulging me with uh, with this conversation. I appreciate it. 
Oh, thank you so much for joining us. It's deeply appreciated. I, um, I specifically appreciate your willingness to call a spade a spade. And I know that that, that willingness comes of course, with great hope and moving forward and passion with the work and also at some cost at times as well. So um, thank you so much for standing with us, all of us. Um, it's greatly appreciated. And just thank you again to the volunteers that put together this um, program. Thank you to Danica for, um, from Sonare Center who's been managing all the tech. Um, you know, she's worked hard with Zoom. It's been, it's been a great partnership. And so thank you Danica for that. And um, also thank you to all of you that have joined us on your Sunday morning for the last several weeks to dig deeper. I know that, um, Pints of the Pack will be getting together to kind of see how we can meet moving forward. And of course, if you have any questions about anything at all, reach out to us. We'd love to talk to you specifically, you know, if you have well, more questions or you want to get involved. So everyone have a beautiful rest of your Sunday. I can't see out the window very well from where I'm sitting, but I hope the snow is done. So take care of you and yours. We'll see you soon. <laughs>